The Civil War. Chapter 10 from Edition 9 or Chapter 8 from Edition 7. At the beginning of the 19th century, slavery was extremely well established in the South, but it was beginning to be ended in the North. And when Missouri caused all that uproar about wanting to come in as a slave state back in 1820, it caused some of the states to, shall we say, rethink the status of the free blacks living in their state. And during the next 20 years, not just the South, but even in Massachusetts, they passed laws to either discourage free blacks from arriving or make it mandatory for them to not come in or to leave the state. You know, it was almost understandable in a slave-holding state, but in the North, Ohio and Massachusetts and New York, well, it's almost a paradox when you think of the racial intolerance of states where slavery didn't even exist. But blacks freed or runaway slaves, they did continue to move westward in the face of all the new restrictions. And the states of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois had more than 41,000 blacks living there by 1840. One black man mentioned near text, born in slavery in Kentucky, called Free Frank, moved west after running away and managed to gain enough money to buy his wife's freedom. Then he moved on to Illinois and founded the settlement of New Philadelphia. Another such immigrant was William Tell. Trail, I'm sorry. Uh, he ran away from his master in Maryland. He won a court battle, actually went to court and got his freedom. Then he founded a community in Indiana and became a very wealthy land-owning farmer. But these were the exceptions. They were not the rule. Remember I was talking about that uh, Dred Scott case back last lesson? Well, the court had ruled that the black man had no rights because he wasn't a citizen. Well, it happened in 1857, but that argument was used before that. 20 years, as a matter of fact. A free black in Pennsylvania back in 1837 wanted to vote. He sued the court, but the court ruled that, quote, that a free Negro or mulatto is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution and laws of the United States and the state of Pennsylvania, and therefore not entitled to the right of suffrage. So the Supreme Court wasn't bringing new ground with their ruling. It was just based on a precedent. However, by 1843, most of the new United States had granted free black suffrage. In New York, Ohio, and Michigan, there were property requirements. The voter had to own so much property in the state before he could vote. But the free black population is declining. And just before the war, it seems to go even further down. In 1830, roughly 2.5% were free, but by 1869, it had declined to 1.6%. And this was due mostly to the rigid laws in the South against being able to free your slaves. And it's, I guess you'd say it's story time. You may not recognize this for what it is. Uh, it's a character portrayal of something called the minstrel show. You see, once upon a time, way back in Cincinnati, there was a musical being performed on, on the stage, and one of the actors was an Irishman who sang and danced and was fairly popular. One day when he was on break, he was out walking down the streets of Cincinnati. He spotted an old black man walking down the street, leading a horse behind him, and he kind of humming to himself and saying a little ditty and did a little hop. <clears throat> he thought, well, my gosh, that looks good. I bet I could incorporate that into my act. So he takes it back and he tries it with his Irish song, and it went over, just did not go at all. He couldn't figure out what was wrong. So he came up with an idea and he used black cork to fatten his face and put on a black wig and hat and fuzz and went out and did it. The same thing again, and it was an instant success. And within a very short time, other groups got together and began calling themselves minstrels. And the Virginia minstrels were one of the most famous. They stood around in a circle. They'd play the banjo and they'd sing songs that they assumed that the black man was singing, was playing. And the people of the North loved it. They thought it was funny. And if, if this is what slavery was like, these happy blacks singing and playing, then slavery wasn't so bad. 
people in the South loved because it showed how happy the blacks were supposed to be. But it was not nice. It was a character. And the main character in all the shows became known as Jim Crow, a slow-moving, very happy black man. And as I said, President Jackson was the president at that time and a slave owner himself, and he did nothing to stop the characters at all. But the characters of making him up a slow-moving, happy black man looking stupid wasn't enough. It wasn't long before we had different types of, uh, shall we say, characters. A lot of people know they hadn't even had any dealings with black slaves. Frederick Douglass called this show the filthy scum of white society, who in order just to make money pandered to the corrupt taste of white citizens. And like I said, it wouldn't be very long before this character wasn't enough. He started using the theory of the black man having a smaller brain and different sized head and this helped promote racial superiority. And as if the black man didn't have enough to overcome, they began to develop some, shall we say, resentment between the elite or educated and wealthy blacks and the normal blacks. And it wasn't just jealousy by blacks or whites. Uh, these lower class blacks, they seemed to get very upset. Why jealousy, uh, fear, uh, calling them pandering to the white man. It, anytime someone has something that you don't have and you have no hope of ever gaining it, you, human nature lets you sometimes do strange things. They destroyed churches and schools and orphanage. And this didn't just take place in the South. It took place in the Midwest and the Northeast. Even the free city of Cincinnati had problems. And of course, the South loved any time they got a report of this kind. And stories began to actually circulate that blacks who had run away were contacting their former owners and wanted to return to the plantation because of bad treatment in the North. But even with all these difficulties, free and runaways continued to migrate west. Blacks could and did own property there. But in the South, even one slip, one tiny little slip or ignorance of the law could send you back into slavery. Or if you could not produce proof of a job or a place to live, you could be arrested and the punishment was to work for the state for an unspecified time. Free labor, you know. Now, every state was prohibiting the end migration of free blacks, just mentioned earlier. And if a city was in the south was on a seaport, of course, no black sailors could leave off the ship. They had to stay on or be jailed. And if the captain allowed them to come to the shore, they had the uh, captain had to pay for their room and board. If the captain refused to pay for the room and board, guess what? They were sold back into slavery. Now, as hard as it is to believe, in the states of Texas, Tennessee, and Louisiana, and later Maryland, laws were passed to give the free black the opportunity to choose his own master and return to slavery. Wow. Now, part of the problem was to keep the blacks from becoming economically sufficient. So the southern states enacted laws to prohibit the black man from even engaging in certain business ventures. Such as in Maryland, they could not sell corn, wheat, or tobacco without a license, which was impossible to get. In Georgia, they could not work as a typesetter. And you couldn't buy or sell liquor in any state. And if an unemployed man was discovered, he would be hired out by the officials. And if that unemployed man had any children, they would be taken from him and placed in the care of a white person so they could learn a trade. And we can go and guess what kind of trade they were going to learn, how to pick cotton. Yet the irony of the whole situation is that there were many, many skilled blacks, free, and even enslaved, living and working in New Orleans and Baltimore and Charleston. Most of the free did work at unskilled manual jobs, yes, both in the North and the South, but there were many who were skilled. In 1860 in New Orleans, free blacks and Creoles owned more than $15 million worth of property. Now, unfortunately, some of this property that they owned was their own family, because even a free black, once you buy someone, a black did not have the authority to free another black person. So it's a lot of times the property that you were owning were your own family. And as I stated, there was not always harmony among the blacks. It depended a lot on your educational level and the level of prosperity. The elite black really had very little patience or time for the unruly, uneducated black man and at times condemned them. 
But then again, there was a lot of racial intermixing in New York, especially among the poor and the new immigrants. But one of the good things that the Blink did do in Palm Beach was to build churches and schools and mutual aid societies. But education to the free or enslaved black was critical. Yes, of course, it was frowned on in the South. And the black schools received much less funding than the white schools even where it was allowed. Education, as I said, was frowned on in the South because of the fear of learning incendiary doctrines, like the ideas of freedom, you know. It's with surprise that they were able to learn even some of the fundamentals. But the elite, they began holding what's called conventions to talk about, well, not only ending slavery, but how to end discrimination as well. And one of the issues at every meeting were the colonization societies, because they were unanimously against them. And they discussed education and women's rights, and also <laughs> the debate on what to be called. Uh, are we going to be called people of color or colored Americans or what? And of course, the call would go out to be to be correct and have decorous deportment uh, to go to church. And thrift was always heard in the meetings of the church at the in in, in the meeting in the meetings, and also remind you to go to church. But what are the female of the race? The black woman is nothing to be overlooked. She's very strong. Has always been strong. And she was kind of the backbone of the race, although she was never allowed a position of leadership in any black societies. The influence these women did wield, and the two women that are mentioned in your chapter, uh, which you didn't you know, have to read, Maria Stewart of Boston, and she spoke out to biracial groups, and she wrote pamphlets, and she even criticized black men for not having enough courage and perseverance, and is considered to be the first black feminist. The other one, of course, mentioned is Sojourner Truth. And we discussed her last lesson. But by the eve of 1860, there were roughly 500,000 free Americans living in the U.S. with a little bit more than that living in the South. However, there were some 4 million still in slavery. And the idea may have been momentarily appealing to abandon the hostile United States, but these people had roots in this nation. They were going to fight to stay here. Now that basically is a very brief, brief summary of chapter eight. You do not have to read the chapter. I've given you everything that you need to know here and it's primarily talking about the discrimination against free blacks in the North and the South. However, I do sincerely hope you've read chapter 10, the Civil War. The Civil War, the nation seems to be burning. When Lincoln became president, and the southern states began to secede, he did not have a unified north behind him. Many of the northern population, especially the Democrats, did not support any war to end slavery. And a lot of the settlers from southern Illinois, Indiana, and Illinois, and even Iowa had migrated up from the south, and they held deep feelings for the south and the institution of slavery. The newspapers were against Lincoln's policies. And when you combine all that with the fear that in the North, that if the free were to be, if the black man were to be free, there'd be a mass exodus to the North and it'd be complete competition for jobs and homes. So Lincoln was going to have to do a very delicate balancing act. In his State of the Union address at the inaugural, uh, he said all he wanted to do was preserve the Union and he would not end slavery where it existed or he was only going to try to stop the spread of slavery. But abolitionists who had supported the election of him were at odds over the policies of not wanting to make the upcoming war an end of slavery. They had come out against his saying, no more slavery, but not a, a vowing to abolish it altogether was what was really upsetting to them. When actual action began after uh, Fort Sumter was attacked, the runaway slave was considered to be contraband or something that had been bought illegally. They were contraband of war and most times would be returned to their owners. Some commanding officers in the Union would actually keep them, but would do what I call scut work or cooking and cleaning, grooming the animals, driving away, service work. But several months into the war, Congress passed an act called the Confiscation Act, which declared that rebel property, including the slaves, could be seized and the slave would be free. 
Now this caused the Lincoln a little bit of a problem and he issued an order saying that freedom did have its restrictions. But not all the southern states had seceded. There are those called the border states, such as Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, and the western part of Virginia, which later would leave Virginia and become West Virginia. Their loyalty depended on several conditions. One of them, slavery. Kentucky was the key. And if you look at this map, you can see why. Here's Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland. And you can see this border. It's the south. It's kind of like a fence between the north and the south. But Kentucky, as I said, is the key. Uh, the Ohio River, the original fence placed around the slavery states. Um, Kentucky has control of the Ohio River. She controls a lot of the Mississippi, the Tennessee, and the Cumberland. There's numerous rivers and creeks internally, and geographically, she was in a perfect position for the Confederates to launch attacks into the free states across the uh, river. As they gained control of the Ohio River, the Confederates could cut the Union in half. Not to mention all those horses and mules, the excess, excessive farm production, and of course, bourbon and tobacco. Now, Kentucky to the north to prevent an attack across the Ohio River. And she given control of the Mississippi, the Union then could cut the Confederacy in half. And very importantly, whichever way Kentucky went, the other neutral states would follow. Lincoln's reported to have said, if we lose Kentucky, we lose the war. Now, in Kentucky, the Civil War was called the Brothers' War, and it really was. Because some of the most famous Kentuckians, such as Clay and Breckenridge, had sons and grandsons that split, and some were on one side and some the other. The state was not united and was kind of a representative of the rest of the nation. The Kentuckians who lived along the Ohio quarter were loyal to the Union, because most of the settlers in the area had arrived down the Ohio from the north and traded on a daily basis with the north. And those along the southern border had come up from the Carolinas and across and traded with the south and were very loyal to the south. The great mass of the middle was kind of a fence setters. They would be loyal to the Union as long as they could keep their slaves. However, that could change in a heartbeat. The biggest thing that caused Kentucky to declare neutrality was that she did not want to become involved fighting with her sister states in the South. She didn't want her own state to become a, you know, battleground where land would be destroyed and people would die for no good reason. So she thought declaring neutrality was a way to go. But Lincoln was a very astute politician, and as I said, he had to keep all sides pro and con happy. And with the abolition of streaming emancipation, he began to think that colonization was the best idea. And Congress apparently thought so too, because they allowed $100,000 for the removal, which we now know would only cover about 10% of the needed funds for the millions to be shipped somewhere. He did hope up to the end of the war that something could be worked out. Moreover, some South American countries were even contacted in the po about the possibility of migrating some American slaves down there. Excuse me, free people of color. Now, Lincoln did not believe in slavery, but never for one minute did he ever think that the black man and the white man were of equal status. He then had a plan to compensate a state for freeing their slaves. He even offered Kentuckians $300 per slave if he would, they would free them. And of course, he was laughed at because some of those slaves were costing upwards of $2,000. Of course, we know they should have taken it, but hindsight is always better than foresight. In the summer of 1862, Lincoln began to consider a proposal to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. But listening to his military commanders and his Secretary of War's advice to wait until the military situation improved for the North. The North had been steadily losing battles ever since Fort Sumter. And Lincoln was having problems finding a general who could not only fight, maybe win a battle, but actually follow up on it. He'd been against having the blacks in the military and, and just as much as George Washington had been. He'd been told that they could not be depended on to fight. They wouldn't be good soldiers or with a gun, they might just turn on any white regardless of the color of the uniform the other white man was wearing. But the war drags on. Where in the beginning, men had volunteered, but as deaths mount, drafts imposed, and Lincoln again reconsiders the use of blacks in the military. But from the beginning of actual battle with the taking of Fort Sumter in the South, 
the veterans were fighting the defensive war and they kept winning battles. The North had a very inadequate supply in their military. They were top heavy in leadership and not enough grunts, as you would call it. Most of the generals were too old to even really be in command and, and they had no good maps to the South. So this is why Lincoln was requested to wait until the military situation became a little bit more favorable for the North. So the North was very definitely at a disadvantage. And change it did. It seems the Confederates got a little bit cocky after a series of victories over the Union and decided to go on the offensive. Now, if they had been successful, the border states, of course, would join the Confederacy. And Britain and France would continue to send aid and even recognize the Confederacy as an independent nation. So a lot hung on the upcoming plans. But the best laid plans, as the saying goes. In September of 1862, General Lee met General McClellan in a place called Antietam in Maryland and was defeated. It was a bloody loss for both sides, but it was the bloodiest one-day battle of the war. Nevertheless, it was a win. And on the strength of that win, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation to take effect in January of 1863. Being with that win, things were not going good for the Union in the North and the East, but in the West, it was a different story. They finally found a general who knew how to fight. General Ulysses S. Grant, he had taken the forts Henry and Donaldson on the Tennessee River. In April, Admiral Farragut had taken New Orleans. Then Grant withstood a Confederate attack at Shiloh, Tennessee. And as your text put it, by this time, momentum in the West stalled a little bit. Dr. Franklin, our text author, says it very nicely in our text. I'm going to quote exactly. Failure of traditional strategies to produce victory strengthened the hand of anti-slavery northerners. The slavery was the foundation of the southern economy. They insisted emancipation was necessary to weaken the South's ability to sustain the war. And here again, uh, you're going to have to have food and everything else. And if there's nobody planting, in other words, destroy them economically. The black man had been willing to fight to the start, but the old fears of an armed black man kept a lot of them from being in favor of this. And Lincoln was under increasing pressure to make the war a war against slavery, which he did with the proclamation. But it was an unenforceable document. It only freed the slaves in those states and territories that were in rebellion. Thus, the neutral slave states like Kentucky could and did keep and sell slaves during the war. And the age-old rhetoric of a black man wanting a white woman and black men taking white men's jobs was used during the 1863 congressional elections. And don't you just love that bit? What this, <laughs> he said the North was afraid that they would become Africanized and be inundated by free blacks. Africanized. Now what does that, what does that mean? And of course the Republicans suffered losses in both Congress, Federal Congress, local Congress legislatures, and lost some governorships. But after Lincoln signed the proclamation. It seemed Lincoln had a change in his way of thinking. He no longer talked about colonization or even compensation to slave owners. Now black men could and did serve in the military. A civil war that had begun when Lincoln proclaiming all he wanted to do was preserve the Union had now taken a big turn. Slavery was going to be ended in blood and immediately. Unfortunately, the reaction in the North to the proclamation was a little bit unfavorable. And there were some entire regiments of Union soldiers that just resigned or just refused to show back up and went home. And I particularly like that paragraph where it describes in a meeting held in Boston on January the 1st, 1863, attended by Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and Harry Beecher Stowe, just to name a few. And they watched, and as the clock, st clock struck midnight, they read the Emancipation out loud. My slave owners in the South did everything they could to keep their slaves from even hearing about this proclamation. And some of the slaves did not know about it till well after the war ended. But by making it a war against slavery instead of just a rebellion, countries of France and England could no longer send aid to the South because they had already outlawed slavery. Some free blacks in the North offered to even go South to organize slave revolts, but the government said no, but the tide is to that. And some whites in the North said they didn't want to fight for blacks' freedom when the blacks weren't fighting, but that was a very small percentage. The biggest objection was from the neutral slave states. Because wearing the uniform of your country was a badge of pride and a symbol of citizenship. 
and the black citizenship was still in question. So President Lincoln had sat on the fence until a big military victory at Antietam. And once the course of the war seemed to dictate that more men were necessary, the order was issued. And General Thomas Sherman even refused to employ them as soldiers. He used them as what I call scout work or in service work only. The Union Army was not only facing less and less enrollments and more deaths, we were facing about 5,000 desertions a month. Now, this is not mentioned in your text, but it, both the North and the South were facing desertions. And maybe desertions is the wrong word. A lot of times, you take these corn-fed boys from out on the farm that had never been 20 miles away from home, you put them in a situation where they're with their buddies, they're walking down a road, and a musket ball comes out, and all of a sudden your buddy's lost his head. It was bad. Usually desertions happened immediately after a battle loss. You, you realize that this is not going to be what you thought it was going to be. Or in the South, more than in the North, if it was time to harvest your crops or plant your crops or your wife's having a baby, you just lay down your musket and go home, basically, to check on things. You weren't really deserting. You were just checking on things at home, and most of the time you'd come back. But military has laws, and it was not a good. And, and you never knew from day to day for sure how many men you were going to have that were there ready to fight. So the necessity of manpower, regardless of skin color, became an evident, and Frederick Douglass even allowed two of his sons to join. The surprising thing is that wherever in the South, such as part of Carolina and New Orleans, that the Union were in control, the free blacks arrived by the thousands to volunteer. So it was not just the Massachusetts 54th, which was the original all-black regiment, and of course they all had white officers, but Later on, there were a few commissioned blacks. The black soldier, the black man, or even the runaway slave, proved to be valuable not only in fighting, but you know, they had knowledge of the South. They had knowledge of where the Southern and Confederate troops were. Medicine. Ha <laughs> ha, medicine. In American history, we do a whole segment on what happened in medicine, but it seemed like any time there's a war, there's always a lot of changes and inventions that come about, and medicine has really come a long, long, long way since it began. Originally, this was a male-dominated field. Nursing had, uh, well, as more and more men are needed on the front lines, the women are brought in, and the reason that they didn't come in at first is because they didn't want us to see the blood and the pain. Uh, did a man ever have any idea what it was like to have a baby? Blood and pain were something that women were well familiar with. But I digress. And as in any time, once a woman starts doing a man's job, that job becomes a woman's job. So it wasn't long before the nursing profession became a female-dominated field. And the United States Sanitary Commission, and I must admit, I always laugh a little bit when I read that name. Women had started it, and it was to help uh, feed, clothe, and, and take care of the sick and the wounded in the, in the military. But it wouldn't be long because the men are going to take over. A woman's place, you know, was in the home, yada, yada, yada. Well, we know about Dorothea Dix, but little is ever said about all those black women who served so dedicatedly. And I hope you read that section carefully. It happens in every war. The men go off to fight and leave the delicate little woman at home who winds up doing the man's job while he's gone. And that is not going to change. Now, not all the blacks that volunteered were actually put in the uniform, especially in the South. They did service work, like cooking and cleaning. They also did the outside work of taking care of the animals, etc. But as the war drags on, the upper-class officers in the South had to send their manservant away because they'd originally brought him with them. Uh, a lot of them chose to stay. And we think this is very strange because we can't understand why when the slave was freed or allowed to go home, why he didn't. But we don't understand that there were a lot of bonds of affection between the slave and his master. And I have found many documented cases of free blacks actually helping supply the Confederacy. And there was probably not a battle fought after 1863 that didn't include at least some black men as soldiers or service personnel, both in the North and the South. Eight all-black infantry regiments fought in the battle of what they called the Battle of Fort Hudson. 
me tell you just a little bit about that. This is supposed to be a pain or character. It was a mala it was bloodbath. Most of the battles were back in those days. And as they say, once upon a time in Norwich, the 26th Regiment Connecticut Volunteers were formed. And they were from all over Eastern Connecticut, and, and during the Civil War, 194 of them were killed or wounded in one day. And there's no single event in the history of Eastern Connecticut that was ever more tragic than the Battle of Fort Hudson fought on May the 27th, 1863. Uh, Fort Hudson was a strategic to the Confederate state, and why? Um, the ports of Charleston and South Carolina and Savannah and Georgia were being blockaded. And this was on the Mississippi, and they had to have a way to get supplies in and out. We're right before the Battle of Gettysburg and Vicksburg. The Federals settled into a siege which lasted 48 days, and the defenders were successfully repelling their, their attackers. But on July the 9th, 1863, after hearing of the fall of Vicksburg, the Confederate garrison of Port, Port Hudson surrendered, which opened the Mississippi River to the Union navigation. There were 507 men in the 26th Regiment, and on that single day, in the heat of the battle, in the hot temperatures of Louisiana on the banks of the Mississippi, 52 were killed and 142 wounded. That's a 30% casualty rate. And as I pointed out, the Battle of Iwo Jima or Invasion of Normandy was a worse percentage rate than even those. Now, the Battle of Port Hudson was, like I say, a siege. It wasn't one day fighting and over with. It lasted from May the 22nd to July the 9th. So it's a long siege, and a lot of people were injured or killed. But the use of black troops by the North and the Union Army was viewed as an outrage by the South. And where the North didn't know for sure how to treat captured blacks, the South had a solution. Some were returned to their masters, but for the most part, a black man helping the Union or in the blue uniform was killed. And when Lincoln heard about this, he also issued the order that for every black soldier killed by the Confederates, a Confederate soldier should be executed. Also not mentioned in your text, one of the things that Lincoln did was, toward the end of the war, he gave General Grant orders to win the war by any means, which kind of explains Sherman's march through Georgia and burning Atlanta. One Confederate officer actually issued the order that he didn't want any more black prisoners. And of course, we know what that means. Now, the Battle of Fort Pillow. Again, one of those hand paintings that you look, it looks like people are being shot. It reminds me a great deal of the paintings we saw of the uh, Boston Massacre. It depends on which side you're on, how you depict the battle. Your text mentions it. And personally, to me, it's a Page of the pot calling the kettle black, because with toward the end of the war and so many, many atrocities taking place by both sides, there's an awful lot of shades of gray. Were black men killed during the battle? Yes. Were white soldiers killed during the battle? Yes. Did General Foster use some of his men during the battle? Yes. Now you get a different version depending on who you talk to. And according to some records that still survive, uh, the killing was in revenge for a brutal killing by the Union of a Confederate officer. True? I don't know for sure. I have not done a lot of research on that particular battle, but I have done a lot of research on General Forrest. And from what I've come to know about him, he would not have ordered the killing of men trying to surrender. But he did believe that war was for killing. And if you've got a gun and you're pointing it at me, I'm going to shoot you back. So you've got the question. Uh, the black soldiers at Fort Pillow were are well aware of the Southern policy of no black prisoners. So were they fighting to stay alive? Uh, were they trying to surrender? It, it looks like no matter which way they go, it, they're between a rock and a hard place. They're going to die. Either fighting for their country or being executed by the Union of the Confederate uh, forces. It'd make a very interesting paper if you ever wanted to do something, uh, the Battle of Fort Pillow. I personally do not believe that Forrest ordered this massacre to take place. And now I'm going to get off my soapbox. Now, several black soldiers or their units earned bravery medals for their war efforts. And one is mentioned in one of the videos you're going to see. It's a battle of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry on Fort Wagner in South Carolina. Disaster. Disaster. 
uh, and their white leader was killed. His name was Shaw. And the, Union, the Southerners thought they were doing a disgrace, so they buried, dug this big hole and they threw his body in with all the dead bodies of the black people. They thought it was a disgrace. But the parents and relatives of the officer, white officer Shaw, wanted to leave him there because he died with his men and they thought he should be buried with his men. As near as we can figure out, some 38,000 plus black soldiers did give their lives during the war. Some died from battle, some died from disease. And there was a lot of this on both sides, death of disease. Because they didn't have all these nice little shots that we have nowadays. And uh, you get a bunch of people who've never been around it. And you don't have as much as three or 4,000 in a camp die from measles or mumps. It's irony that the black men worked as hard, died as quick as the white man, but was never given equal pay. But to continue in a war, a nation must have a stable or growing economy. And the South's economy was in shambles. With all the white men gone to war, the men taking over men's jobs, and the slave either running away or not following orders, the agriculture in the South went downhill in a hurry. The letters and diaries of the Southern men and women tell of the blacks becoming insolent and unruly and refusing to follow orders. The situation became so bad in some places that white plantation owners actually sought the safety from their slaves with the Union soldiers, which I found quite amusing. I'm sorry. But in the South, the black man was also indispensable. They worked in factories and mines and even navigated vessels. So you have the story of Robert Smalls. Go online and learn that whole story. There's a lot more to it than him just surrendering the vessel to the Union. I think it was quite well done. By the time the Confederates realized that they needed the black men in the army and got their Congress to approve, the war was almost over. So too little, too late. In many cases, wars don't decide anything except who has the biggest army. But this war, the war where Americans killed Americans, it did decide two things. One, that the federal government trumps the state. In other words, the state cannot secede from the Union and slavery is against the law. So what now? What is freedom going to mean to all those millions of newly freed blacks? And how is white America, especially in the South, going to react? Will equal rights be awarded? That's just a couple of the questions that we're going to be asking in the next chapter. The promises and pitfalls of reconstruction. And believe me, there are a lot of them. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I was a little bit disappointed in this chapter. It didn't give you any more of the battle. They just told two battles, you know, very briefly. Her, her, uh, but then again, this is not an American history class. It's black history class. And most of the black men who served, even if they received battles, they served in units. And there were hundreds of thousands of them around, both in the North and the South. Because they're fighting for not only their country's freedom, but their own personal freedom. Were some of them fighting for revenge just to kill a white man? I'm sure there was some of that. But basically, we've never had any problem with the African-American volunteering to fight for his country.